My name is Dom D. Morgan. Um, my nickname is China. Why they call me China? I could not speak English. I've actually, I've actually started speaking English as, as I got older. I spent most of my time in the bush. I got a lot of elders, and they actually gave me huge responsibility on carrying on for the future and teaching younger people about our law, the traditional law. Anyway, um, I come from the Dedaway people, and I'm the, I come from my um, grandfather and grandmother country, and we come from the Sunset Tribe. Our, our country is um, Wundagiri. It means this is our country, this is our home. And in that, in that area, there's a small community, a uh, population of uh, 400, 500. We had it running fairly well, and we had CDP, we had, oh, just about, like we had school, we had a lot of stuff. We had a, um, a warden scheme in, in the community that actually supports the community, and it's from our own people itself, not, not the police force, and we was working in with the police. This was, the warden scheme was set up in 1994. And it was, uh, I'm not too sure how, how they actually got it, but it came through Parliament side, I think the um, AAD had something to do with it, and set that scheme up fairly well. It was running really good. We've, we've actually started looking after the community and community people by teaching them education and getting kids to go to school and have a lot of other um, community um, actions on the side, like social stuff. And we started um, planning on food and stuff like that. Until one day the government actually changed. That's why I don't really have any respect for the um, state government. I've actually have a lot of pain, a lot of anger on the decision when they actually shut the community down and the, com um, the community of um, 500 people. When they made a decision, they actually sent in the police force in the community and they started pinpointing the uh, uh, powerful men, the men who actually speak up for people in the community and make sure they was going good, make sure they was well looked after. But um, due to all that, like um, beforehand, um, the, the young ones, we actually got off the street, streets in Wyndham. Wyndham was a um, small, small town, population of 1,500, 1,800 roughly. Now, now it varies, depends on where people move. Um, when that actually um, happened, like for the community actually shutting down, they actually, we didn't know, like, um, by speaking up, by looking after other people, and when they actually got picked on by the, by the law itself, by, by the police and stuff like that, we was always there, and like we had a really strong council, and the council was there uh, by heart, by faith. And they was very strong because of the, the pride they had and the dignity they actually followed because of our common law. Our traditional law was really powerful. Mm -hmm. If I, um, one of the um, youngest mess up or one of the eldest mess up, they was sorted out straight away. And that's why it was so powerful. And our laws still carry on today, even though the community actually closed down. But from, from that side, like how we've actually moved on now, sort of, but it, it sort of moved on only because of trying to think that I'm making life a lot better. And that's why I was very honored and proud that um, I've actually got the choice to come up by Michael and Sharon by giving me that chance to come here and talk about our community. And that's why this treaty is really very important. You know, if you, if you really want to go, have something like that. You've got to have people who's dedicated. You don't want people who, who's not going to talk up, who's going to backstab you. No, you've got to put your heart and soul into it. And you've got to have the heart like a lion. And, you know, you don't, you don't give up. You don't let your partner go down. You don't, never, you know, think you've got to support him 100%, 110%. And for me coming this way, it was very hard because I sort of closed myself down four or five years. I, I went in a dark area. Why not talk?
due to all that, um, because we are a very strong family, and when I say family, like um, it's not just individual family. The way my dad actually told me something, he said, see this family here, they smoke on the streets, they're drinking. Here they smoke on drugs, doing all that stuff. That's still your family. But how the way we was brought up, we brought up not just the family, like how white people say, oh, this is my family, and that's only individual sides. No, when we say family, we built into a tribe, and in that tribe, you look after that tribe as one. Don't care where you go. You can go as far as you want to go. You can learn education. You can do whatever. You still got to come home. You still got to meet the same people, and you still got to have family there. And that's where your heart lies, with your family. Anyway, um, when they actually shut the community down, the uh, government actually came through and actually broke the community by shutting down the council. Um, but they actually shut the council down because um, there was really strong at heart and the support from the community side was really, really strong. And how they actually broke it down was by the police force coming through the community and picking on the people who actually talk up the, the, the leaders. And with one of the leaders that's now is still sitting in prison, and that's my older brother. Um, he actually gave me that chance and opportunity of taking over. He said to stand up and you, you take over my position because I won't take long. <coughs> this is nine years now and he's still in prison. Um, the thing is, when he actually gave me that opportunity, I, I stood up and it was very hard for me because I didn't understand the role what he actually took on. He was, he was the um, vice chairperson in the community. He actually did the chairperson job because like, um, we, he was, um, the, older, the older cousin brother was, a, um, was the chairperson. My older brother was the vice chairperson. And they stood together. And they stood together as one. Um, they actually broke the two of them because they ended up locking them up. When they, when they actually, when the police force came through, they went through and they picked on all the young ones first. And the ages when they actually picked on all the young ones was from 16, 16 to about 23. And in the community, the population, well, all, just about all men mainly, and had a, a, a young girls, ladies, things like that. Now, the amount of young people actually got charged would have been about, oh, I couldn't really give, give you a number, but it was over 50, all with child abuse. That's what they said, and that's what the police used. They, they used child abuse. And what they did was actually send them out of the community. And when they sent them out of the community, they didn't actually go, just, they wasn't allowed to go like, to the next town that was with them. And with them, you, know, you, know, you can only, you can fly there 15 minutes. They wasn't allowed to stay in Wyndham. They wasn't allowed to stay in Kanamara, where 100 k's away. They had to move to Broome, and Broome was um, 1,200 k's away, about 1,200 k's away. They actually had to go out there and defend for themselves. The thing is, when they was on CDP, CDP is a, um, it's, it's similar to social, but you had to work for your money. And the thing is, when they actually got sent to Broome, they got sent to Broome, they had no income, because if you don't work, you don't get paid. And it was very hard for them to get on social, because they got, you know, social got their own rules. You know, you got to stay off by eight months before you can never apply for a social. Anyway, they actually stayed in the township in, in Broome. And that's what caused most of them um, young people, families, to actually move out, went to Broome to try and, you know, for, for sons and daughters and things like that. Or when you got a heart and you love people, you'll always be there for them, you know. And that's what our people was. It was like that. Very kind-hearted. Anyway, they, um, a lot went to Broome. A lot faced they charged. Never got charged because it didn't happen. It was only the way how white people put it on paper, how they went to court, and that's what they did. They did that with all the youngins first, and then when they couldn't get the youngins, they came back for the elders. A lot of the elders. I even got charged. And, and the thing is, when I got charged, I got caught for child abuse. And when they looked at me, because like I'm... Um, they thought I was going to break. The sergeant was actually, uh, he, was, he was on, on that. He was, they had a base there in Humbulgari. He was good. He, was good. he came up and he saw me and said, oh, China, you've got to be careful. It's got, it's, there's a big plane coming and a lot of elders getting locked up. I said, what for? 
Ik heb een jonge lijn van de les, Charles. Hij zei: Gir her je. En dan zei hij: Ik heb een talk met dat shit. Excuse my language, but yeah. Um, here we go now, I'm not joking. I said, well, what gave them the idea to charge me and to charge this mob here? Because we, we did nothing. They go, nah, this is what they're doing. This is the task force. Task force, when, they, when the plane actually landed, they had about 23 coppers and two CIVs, or four CIVs, I mean, on a different plane, but there were 23 on, on one big plane and four on a little charter, a five-seater charter. Anyway, and they approached me. I was sitting on that, on that thing then. They asked me, Mr. Morgan, asked my name. I said, okay, so this is me. They said, oh, you know your charge? And they started laughing. I said, how are you laughing about? This is a joke. You, you're coming and picking me, picking me up? You know, you charge. You should know what for. And the thing is, we wasn't told why we was charged. We was, none of the elders in the whole community was not told. We was picked up. And we had about four, four, five planes. We got picked up, taken to Kamalara, and locked up. And the thing was, we was not allowed one phone call to find out if we could, you know, for legal advice. We was never allowed that. Two days straight. And two days straight in the lockup. I'll tell you what it was very saddening to see. Uh, Kamalara lockup was very disgraceful because. When you walk in the room, they actually did toilet everywhere. They, excuse my language again, but they actually pissed everywhere. And the cells where they, where they kept all the elders and, and me included. The thing was, I, I couldn't believe it, you know. I said, you know, what's going on? It smells. They gave us beds. Beds was wet. Sheets and blankets was wet. And up the way, our cold weather is, it's, Nothing like how it is now, but it's cold, cold, cold. The thing was, I said, nah, uh, you know, for me as a traditional man, I, I lived in the bush, and when I went up in the bush, I didn't have clothes on. I, I, I stayed in the bush for about three months, and I said, this is, you know, this is only a few days. And once I, I, I slept, I sat down, and, you know, across my legs, sat down, and that's how I slept. The first day, and the first night, they had the lights on really bad, they turned all the air conditioning off. They're on the second though, mm -hmm. yeah. And like what they actually did was open the, you know, they um, come out of prison is actually open. And they, can, they got shelters there, they shut the um, windows and things like that now. But up the way, the mosquitoes were really bad. So what they actually did was mistreated me, myself, my, and plus all the elders that actually got locked up. They say, hey, open the windows and let the mosquitoes in. But it didn't really bother us because, you know, we're used to that stuff. We, we mentally minded and tough and hard and tired, you know. Um, anyway, we all went to trial. As soon as I was told, after two days, you know, on, like, because um, we got locked up on a Friday, we wasn't told nothing until on Monday when we actually went to court. When we got to court, we were told, then we all got charged. And the charges, and they told us what the charges was. We, we couldn't believe it. Could not believe it. And anyway, when we did the charge, oh, oh, we did the thing. Oh, when we went to court, the thing was they made it so hard. The state government made it so hard for get bail. My bail, just alone, and I, I'm, I'm one of the youngest out of the elders, was one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to put up for bail. And the thing was, I had a lot of money. I was, I was, I was you know, I, I started, you know, like working and saving when I was young. But the thing is, you was not allowed to use your own money. Yeah, and that's what we was told. And the rest of the elders couldn't afford because they, their bail was more than 200,000. They couldn't afford it. Yeah. So they actually went in and every time they had their court case coming up, they postponed it for another date. So they actually did roughly 18 months before any kind of hearing. And when they actually did their hearing, the thing is, my older brother now is still sitting in prison now. And I, I can, you know, put all my heart and soul into 
when he actually got charged, he was not living in the community. He never lived there. Never ever lived there. And he got charged for the attacks and the thing is. And when he, the thing was, he, he was not, like he tried to ask his lawyer if he could get up and say, you know, I think he, they didn't tell him why it was, what dates he got charged for. And then um, they actually changed the law here in Western Australia about sexual abuse and rape because this, this man, my older brother, is, is a lot like Michael, big at heart, big gentleman, very you know, intelligent, and you know, let you say your words and things like that now and to support you. He, he was like that, he, and he's still like that. You know? um, but the thing is, what they actually changed here in Western Australia was what he meant for his trial. They stated his name really bad on the media, plus all of us in the media, and saying this and saying that. It did not happen, but when he went for his trial, his first trial, they did have no evidence at all. They asked him for a DNA test. He was willing and he gave it. And the thing is, nothing ever happened because he didn't do it. He, for his first trial, he actually got charged under suspicion, only under suspicion. And after that, he had another trial. And this is one trial that never happened, as far as I know, in Western Australia. It's for a charge of rape. It was step by step. He had 14 charges. And the thing was, he won that 14 charges. <coughs> like, just to give you an example, that never happened in Western Australia, is that when you go for rape charge, it's a rape charge. But how he actually got charged was by, like, four or 14 charges, by taking the shirt off, pulling the top down. That was one charge. The other charge was pulling the dress down, pulling the pants down. That was the next charge. And then step by step, that was 14. It wasn't just a rape charge. There was 14 charges that they actually did, and he won the whole lot. He won it out, right? And he, when he went back, after winning that, then they had to, like the, the, the judge at that time said to the um, jury, be careful on what you're actually doing, because this is only suspicion. He did not do it. And the thing is, still today, like, um, how, how I see the state government is very, you know, they, they like a snake. Very evil, yeah, and like a snake. Be careful if you're gonna really step and say things like the young lady up there when you spoke about your younger sister, and things like that now. I tell you what, the law can actually twist yourself and twist your family in any which way they can. If, and if they wanna do that, they can do that. The thing is, be careful on your actions and your words, because your words is a bit harder than your actions, you know? It's like I, I learned, it's like um, I learned a lot. I learned fighting physically doesn't get you anywhere. do not get you anywhere in life. The thing is, learning education is the most important thing, and learning how to put it on paper. You know, the, the pen is sharper than the sword, because once you've got it down on paper, on black and white, and if you ever sign it across to anybody to read it, it makes a lot of sense. But if you fight it with fists and with power, it doesn't work because it all it all it does is get you in trouble. And you get locked up and you get hated. And the thing is, the media get the wrong story. So like just really like when we do set up this I'm hoping like if we do set up a committee or a council or whatever, I I wouldn't mind sitting on that and like a lot of people say, you know, money. Money is not an issue because we came in the world with nothing. You know? If you put yourself together, you know, anything is possible. Heart is the main thing, is joining it. And like um, yeah, my, my dad and plus all, all my elder people actually told me, and the thing is what I believe in, is that a lot of people they can think from the mind, well you can go with your heart. But if you learn to combine your mind and your heart, that's good. But the thing is a lot of people figure about the breath. My, my, my dad and my grandparents and a lot of elders said, you always use your head, then you combine it with your heart. But your breath is patience, and patience is a virtue. When you take that step back, you look at your actions. Make sure you're doing it properly. Make sure you listen to your head and your heart. That's your patience, that's your breath, and that's virtue. You know, time is the essence. 
but you have all the time in the world. You know? You got to live life to fullest, and you, you know, you treat everybody with respect. Because when you get up in the morning, I'm sure you comb your hair, you wash your face. If you love yourself, love other people too. Mm -hmm. And you know, like from the cultural side, I sort of died down a bit because um, my mum. Actually, taught, um, taught me a lot, taught me a lot, and now that she passed on, because like I'm, that's why I'm sort of angry with the, with the Lord itself. They don't care what age you are, they don't care how healthy you are. The thing is, that's their job and duty. And if they get told, like the police force now, they 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 like a cult, you know. They get told what to do, and that's what they're gonna do. Otherwise, they get sacked. They move on. But the thing is, what sort of saddened me and you know, why I went on the dark spot was when, when my mum actually got locked up. And she had a heart problem. She, she had, um, I don't know what you call it, a thing with a heart, um, a pacemaker. And plus my sister had a pacemaker. And the police didn't care at all. They thought they was going to break us from standing up and telling them right from wrong. The thing is, we learned that. We learned that from our elders. You do something wrong, face the penalty, you know. You, you get up there, if they want to sort you out, you could sort it out. But if you're right, you fight for it. You stand, don't care what, don't, don't ever break. But yeah, um, that's why I wanted an ask spot, because when my mother actually got locked up, she was very old, like, um, she came from the stolen generation. She never ever spent time with her uh, media family. She got taken away when she was young. But at the time when they locked her up, she was 80, 83. Maybe more older because they discussed her age, the government discussed her age. The thing is, she never ever had a bad bone in her body, as far as I know. And she always had the heart to tell us, you know, be careful. Look after yourself, you know, stuff like that. And even my sister now, um, she actually got locked up too and she's got a pacemaker too. The thing is, the law, the law is the law. You know, our, our law and culture, it actually died down because of the law. How the government did, did, um, did these days, they stop you from using your law. You, you know, it's sad to see. That's why, like with me, coming here, it was very, I, I felt sort of proud and I felt more sad than anything else. You know, and like with that anger sort of died down on me now because the only way you can hurt them now is by hitting them the way they hit you, pen and paper, and speaking them properly. You know, the thing is, never step back. If you know what's right, let's go do it. And the thing is, getting money is not an issue. You know, you could um, put on discos. You got, you got all different functions you could make to raise money. You don't have to go to the government. You just, you just would be there. Like you said, we, you know, we had a veggie garden, doing all that stuff. You, know, you can make money in a lot of different areas, different ways. You can even save money. But like, um, if we do set up this, maybe this council or whatever, I wouldn't mind sitting on, sitting on it. Because when I do go back, because here I'm speaking for all of us, and plus the people back that way, like in the Kimberley, you don't get this opportunity. You don't get the support. It's very hard. You got um, ALS. And they, uh, I think they're a bit scared of the law. If they, if they go on the wrong side, they get picked up. It's different in the Kimberleys. There's nothing like here. Here, you've got the media. And here, with the media, there's big ground, powerful. You know, use them, if, if anything. From the heart, that's where you've got to work. And combine the three. If you combine the three, you can go back and sit back. You know, everybody got anger. Everybody got ideas. Everybody got brains, everybody got knowledge, you know? If you put it in the right place, nothing is hard, nothing is difficult. It'll work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.